Today we're going to talk a little bit about the litigation process, which is the process of going to court. So, um, really, when we're talking about solving legal disputes, you have two options. Litigation, going to court, or what we call alternative dispute resolution, which is any of a variety of other options. And I'll talk about those when we get to the end of them. Um, and so litigation is really the process of filing claims in court and then ultimately going to trial. And what happens when two, when, when two parties have some kind of dispute that they cannot solve and they cannot solve it in any of the other alternative means is that one of the parties goes to court and files what's called a complaint. And the complaint basically says that I have been aggrieved by this person or this entity um, in these ways. And so they, they, in their complaint, they have a statement of facts and the alleged legal claims that have been made. Once I make my complaint, the court issues what's called a summons. And the summons is a paper that orders the defendant to answer the complaint within 20 days. The defendant then has a responsibility to reply to each of those allegations on the complaint. And again, that's referred to as the answer. People receive a lawsuit and they think, oh, if I don't respond to this, it'll just go away. It doesn't go away. Um, what happens if you don't respond to the lawsuit within the uh, specified period of time is that the plaintiff can then go to the court and say the defendant didn't respond, I would like what's called a default judgment. And that is a decision in my favor that I have won because the defendant failed to answer in time. Um, there are legitimate reasons why a defendant may not answer a lawsuit. Maybe they have been incapacitated in some way. Maybe they've moved and the summons went to the wrong address. Maybe they weren't properly served with the lawsuit. And so it would then be up to the defendant to show that one of those valid reasons applied and the de default judgment um, should be set aside. But if you don't respond, don't think it goes away. Uh, frequently what happens in a legal case is that, um, oops, I see a typo in my slides. I'm gonna take care of that before you guys see it in Canvas. Um, frequently what happens uh, when, uh, when a, someone is sued is that um, the bad feelings go both ways. And so frequently when you have a lawsuit, you have the plaintiff suing the defendant and then the defendant also sues the plaintiff. That's referred to as a counterclaim. So the plaintiff is suing the defendant, the defendant is suing the plaintiff, everyone is suing each other. And so that counterclaim goes back to the plaintiff and then the plaintiff is required to answer with what's called a reply. Um, and so the, that, those processes are really what starts a lawsuit. There are times when one plaintiff might represent a group of plaintiffs. Little class action story time for you. Um, one day years ago, I came home from work and in my mail, which you should always open your mail even if it looks like junk because this looks like junk. In the mail was a gift certificate from Toyota for a free oil change, $40 uh, off of a, um, like a $40 gift card for the Toyota store and then a coupon for 20% off of something else. Pretty substantial. Uh, didn't really kind of pay attention to what the class action stuff said. The newspaper the next day had the article that told that that kind of filled in the blanks of why I received this. As it turns out, um, this woman took her Toyota into Toyota. It was one of the local Toyota dealerships, and um, brand new Toyota Corolla. She took it in, um, had it for three months, took it in for the three month service. Um, when she was presented with the bill, she was presented with like an obscene, it was like $1,100. And this was like in 2008 or 2009. So it was a lot of money. And so she couldn't believe that a brand new car would have a service that was that expensive. So she sat down with the service manager and asked the service manager, do, 
were each of these things that you did to my car required? And she went line item by line item. One of the services that they performed on her Toyota was like a fuel injection cleaning, blah, 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 blah. And the service manager said, well, yes, that was required. So she goes home, thinks about it. And at the time, she called up Toyota North America in Long Beach. And she asked them specifically, OK, I the service on the cars is then she went through line by line what they told her had been required on her car. And when they got to that fuel inject injector cleaning service, Toyota of North America said, well, that's not required, but it is recommended. So she called Toyota back dealership and she said, hey, I want my money back. Um, Toyota told her no. So she hired an attorney and the attorney wrote a letter on her for her behalf. Toyota said no. So the attorney filed a lawsuit. And when the attorney filed the lawsuit, the attorney said to the court, basically in their motion for a class action, that if this has happened to this one plaintiff, chances are it's happened to other people who have had their Toyotas serviced at Toyota Carlsbad of of, in the recent you know, few years. And so the court certified a class of everyone who had had their Toyota serviced by Toyota um, within like from 2003 to 2006. So lots and lots of cars. All of a sudden, it wasn't just this one girl that was the plaintiff. She was representing thousands of people. And all of a sudden, Toyota started to listen to her. And ultimately, they settled the case out of court. Um, I received uh, the gift card, the free oil change, and all the other stuff based on the value of my car. I drove a Toyota Sequoia at the time, so it was a, kind of a, a higher-end Toyota. Um, she received, for her troubles, I think $60,000 for being the lead plaintiff. And then the attorneys split a million dollars each. So they were fine. Don't have to worry about the attorneys. But you can see in that example the power of what a class action can do. Class action lawsuits are very effective at turning a um, relatively small plaintiff into a much larger fish when competing with a big organization. Um, so class action lawsuits, uh, check your mail. Uh, I probably get like two to three class action settlements each year, and they generally tend to be pretty good. So, so the plaintiff might ask for class action if they, for example, are representing a large group of people. The defense is always going to ask for a motion to dismiss. And this is basically a request to the court to please terminate the case. There's no point. You know, the, the plaintiff, uh, the allegations don't make sense. The plaintiff may have missed something procedurally. There may be something that um, the court should nullify, meaning there may be something that the plaintiff has done or not done that could re that would make sense for the court to terminate the whole case. Um, if the court says, no, we are not going to dismiss, then we start into what's called the discovery process. And the discovery process is where each side shows the other side its evidence. And the reason for that is this. The point of our legal system is to keep you out of it. I'm going to say that again. The point of our legal system is to keep you out of it. Um, and so our legal system is founded on this idea that if each side shows the other side its case, then both sides might be more motivated to settle the case out of court. Because going to court is time consuming, it's expensive, and our court, courts tend to be overrun with a lot of cases. Um, the most common um, pieces of the discovery process are first of all depositions. Depositions are um, when you sit down and answer questions for the opposing party, uh, or, or sometimes for, for your side, but you're answering questions by each attorney and it's under oath. The judge isn't there, but they are recorded by a reporter, and you're answering those questions under oath. Um, interrogatories are written questions that, that are written out and you have to record the answers, also under oath. Uh, the court might require a production of documents and materials 
Um, if I'm suing, for example, my insurance agency um, about a repair that was that they paid for for my house, and I'm saying that th that it wasn't done correctly, um, the court might ask for me to submit um, the policy, the um, the repair contract, and then I might have to submit something from um, a, an inspector that says that the repair wasn't done correctly. So that's the production of documents um, in in cases where there might be some physical injury involved, um, the plaintiff might have to submit themselves to medical or psychological evaluations um, performed by a professional um, that is hired by the opposing side. So I might have to submit to a medical examination that's hired by um, the defense attorneys. Sometimes when you have a really powerful defendant or a really powerful plaintiff, um, what they might do is file for lots of depositions and lots of interrogatories and kind of like try to bury you with paperwork. When that happens, um, the, you can ask the court for a protective order, which basically is a request to the court to require the other side to limit their discovery. Uh, sometimes people don't answer their interrogatories or they may not attend their depositions. And so you might have to ask the court for what's called a motion to compel, which is a motion to get the other party to take some kind of action. Sorry, my dishwasher is going in the background. I really hope you guys can't hear that. Um, once you have filed the case and you've produced, you've gone through the discovery process, uh, you might ask the judge to enter a judgment in my favor without having to go to a trial. And that's called a summary judgment. And you ask for a summary judgment when one, there are no material facts in dispute and the party is entitled to a judgment as a matter of law, okay? And so summary judgment is basically asking the court, you know what, judge, it's clear from the, the facts and the discovery that, we've, that, that there's, no, there's no trial necessary because either I've proven what I needed to prove or there's really no material facts that, that are in dispute. If the summary judgment is granted, the case is over. If the summary judgment is not granted, then we start talking about going to trial. Um, like, I, like I said, you know, our, our, our legal system is designed to keep you out of it. And so as part of that, we have an adversarial system. And we have an adversarial system in the sense that the truth emerges by letting each side examine opposing witnesses. Um, and so when the plaintiff is on the witness stand, they get questioned by both their attorney and the attorney for the opposing side, because each attorney is gonna try to, to, to nuance the story in a way that works for you. And so by letting the opposing attorney question you, that you have, the jury has the ability to kind of hear the contradicting facts and decide where the truth happens to be. Uh, under the Constitution, the Sixth and Seventh Amendments afford you the right to a jury trial. The Sixth Amendment is a jury trial in a criminal proceeding, and the Seventh Amendment um, uh, allows you for a jury trial in a civil proceeding. Just because you have the right to a jury trial doesn't mean that you necessarily want one. Sometimes, um, let's say that um, it's an intellectual property case and the lawsuit is so highly technical that you don't think that a jury is gonna get it. Um, then you might ask the judge to be the jury and that's what's referred to as a bench trial. When the case is heard by the judge only and the right to, your, to a jury trial is waived. Bench trials are also used when you have a defendant that a jury might not find um, very likable, for example. Uh, juries are different in every state. In California, we have 12 people on our juries. Juries in California have to make a unanimous decision. So if you have one person who disagrees with the other 11, then you do not have a unanimous decision and you have what's called a mistrial, which means the case is over. Either you have to start again with a new jury or 
you decide that it's not worth it and you just go your separate ways and take your marbles and go home. Juries are selected through what's called the voir dire process. And the voir dire process starts with a jury summons that you get in the mail. Most of the time in San Diego County, you are going to get a jury summons from the Vista Courthouse. Um, pay attention. If you get a jury summons and you open it up and it says San Diego and you live in Oceanside, you have the right to have your service moved to Vista. Um, all you need to do, there's generally a, a website that you go on. Um, sometimes there's a number that you call and they will move your service to the closest courthouse to your residence. Um, right now, what they do is they send out a summons um, and you receive it for wherever they need jurors. Most of the time right now, they need jurors in downtown San Diego. So um, if you get a summons, move it to Vista. Um, once you're called for jury service, and you're brought into a courtroom, um, you're asked questions by each attorney in the voir dire process. And the attorneys will take turns excusing jurors that they think may not be favorable to their case. So they're looking for jurors that have demonstrated some kind of likely bias. And if they can show that, you've, um, that you have demonstrated a bias, let's say, for example, they ask you how you feel about police officers and you say, oh, well, my dad was a police officer and all of his friends are police officers and I think they're great and I, I know that they have more authority and da-da-da-da-da, then you might get um, excused for bias um, against a defendant. If you go up there and you say, well, I hate cops, blah, 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 then you might get excused for bias against um, the law enforcement community. So it really just, you know, kind of depends on what it is that you say. Um, so those are four cause challenges. Uh, the attorneys also will get a limited number of what are called preemptory challenges, which basically means that um, they can select people to be excused without any reason. They just don't like the looks of you, the sound of you, the whatever. They don't have to say why they're excusing you, um, but you just will be excused. Moving on to the trial. The burden is, of proof is really about to what extent you need to prove your case. In a civil case, you have, to, you have to prove your case by a preponderance of the evidence. That just means that it's more likely than not that it happened, that the incident happened or the case, you are 51% more believable than the other party. Um, in a criminal case, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. And beyond a reasonable doubt means that the evidence is so convincing that a reasonable person would accept it as fact. Um, I always think of like the scales of justice and I think like 99, you need to prove your case 99.9% .9 in a criminal case and you need to prove 51% in a civil case. Sometimes there are limited cases that require clear and convincing evidence. Clear and convincing is a, is a higher than a preponderance, but less than a reasonable doubt. And that basically means that the evidence has to be sufficiently compelling. This is generally used when there's more than money, in stake, money at stake, such as someone's civil liberty. So in looking at, you know, kind of the way that um, the, uh, the burden works, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, you have to prove it. You, you have to be 99.999% convincing. Clear and convincing, I see that more like 60-40. And then preponderance is more like 51%. Moving on to the trial. The trial starts with the plaintiff's case. Um, each side has the option, for, or each side will start with what are called opening arguments. The plaintiff always starts. The defense has the right to do their opening argument right after the plaintiff does their opening argument, or they can wait until the beginning of their case. Uh, generally, they do it right after the plaintiff does their opening argument. So the plaintiff starts their case, and the plaintiff's attorney calls, calls their witnesses. Um, direct examination is when you question your own witnesses. Cross-examination is, again, when the other party's attorney cross-examines uh, the plaintiff wit or cross-examines you or plaintiff's attorney, plaintiff's witnesses. 
So each party's attorneys get the opportunity to question. At the culmination of the plaintiff's case, the defense will move for what's called a directed verdict. And generally, this, this basically is a judge-made ruling that says that the plaintiff did not prove their case, and there is no reason for the defense to have to put on a case because the plaintiff didn't meet their burden. This is rare. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot. Uh, but you make the motion for a directed verdict. Judge is probably going to say no. And then you move on to the defendant's case, which lo looks just like the plaintiff's case. Defense attorneys direct uh, cross-examine their own or examine their own witnesses and the plaintiff's attorneys will do the cross-examination. Once both parties have presented their cases, we have closing arguments. And this is where the where each side summarizes their case in hopes that the jury is going to agree with them. Um, next come jury instructions. The judge instructs the jury on how to evaluate the evidence. Um, which leads you to, well, what is the judge's role in all of this? Um, number one, the judge's job is to keep the order and decorum of the proceedings. They control the courtroom. They are the courtroom manager. They make legal, legal decisions as to the admissibility of evidence. They instruct jurors and they clarify issues of law. It's the judge's job to explain the law to the jury. Um, in the bench trial, the judge will determine the facts and apply the law. And in criminal trials, the judge, their job is to sentence the defendant. So it's not the jury that sentences the defendant in most cases, unless it's like, for example, a death penalty case in a state where if the jury decides it's an automatic death penalty. Um, but for the most part, in a criminal trial, it's the judge has some leeway in sentencing a defendant. Um, so the jury deliberates informally. They, they are not allowed to talk about the case to one another or to anyone externally until they are in the jury room and they are deliberating. Um, all of the jurors are entitled to voice their opinion. Like I said, in California, the verdict has to be unanimous. Everyone has to agree. If one person disagrees, then you have a mistrial. Once the jury makes their decision, typically um, you might have the losing party ask for a judgment non obstante verdicto or a JNOV, um, which is a judgment notwithstanding the jury's verdict, which basically is a, a request to the judge to set aside the jury's decision and make their own decision. Also extremely rare. In most cases, the losing party has the right of appeal. Um, there are some case, there are some types of cases like um, small claims court, for example. You don't have the right of appeal to a small claims case. Um, however, if you're suing somebody in civil court at the Vista Courthouse, let's say it's like a $25,000 lawsuit over, I don't know, um, a contract dispute, and you are the losing party, you have the right of appeal. And what happens with the, with the appeal is um, the appellate court, um, which is not, you no longer have one judge and a jury. There is no jury, jury at the appellate court. And there's, in California, there's three judges. And they read the court record, what's taken down by the court reporter, and they look for errors of law, OK? They don't allow any new evidence, OK? They don't allow any new testimony. And when they make a decision, they have five options. First, they can affirm. And basically what that means is that that's allowing the lower court's decision to stand. Modify means that they're affirming the outcome, but they're making changes. A lot of times modifications have to do with um, uh, award sizes. So in California, for example, in most, case, most states, for example, um, when you have a case that has um, compensatory and punitive damages, two types of damages, I'll talk about those later, um, but we have a legal limit on how much you're allowed to financially punish someone. And um, generally, if you have $100,000 in compensatory damages, you're only allowed, three, you're only allowed to punish up to $300,000. It's like three, three times, treble damages. And so, 
if, but juries don't know this. And so if a jury awards somebody $100,000 and $500,000 in punitive damages, the appellate court will modify that and they will reduce the summer, they, they will reduce the judgment to whatever the legal, uh, whatever the law allows. Um, so that's a modification. Um, reverse and remand, that nullifies the lower court's decision and it returns the case for reconsideration. So basically, it is saying back to the lower court, you need to try this case over again because some mistake has been made. A reverse is turning the loser into the winner with no new trial. And then we have what's called a harmless error, which is a mistake that was made by the trial judge, but it's too minor to affect the outcome of the case. And um, I have a video for you that's the uh, breakdown of the appellate process. It's a really nice summary for that. I encourage you to watch it um, because I do like to ask you about what appellate courts do because appellate courts, remember, um, once the appellate court um, publishes their decision, this is the first place where the decision is going to be published. Once that decision is published, it becomes part of common law. It becomes part of the case precedent. It sets precedent. Um, I'm just going to come back here. So very important step in the legal process is what the appeals court does because those published opinions create our common law. So that was the litigation process. Everything else is referred to as alternative dispute resolution. The majority of disputes are settled through negotiation. I'm not happy, you're not happy, we somehow negotiate between ourselves, maybe an attorney is required, maybe attorney is not required, and we resolve our dispute. Okay, that's through negotiation. Sometimes negotiation isn't enough and you need a little help. Um, so mediation is probably the most common type of alternative dispute resolution. And the mediator is a neutral third party who attempts to guide the two disputing parties toward a voluntary settlement. So what that means is it's the job of the mediator to kind of coach the two sides into settling the dispute themselves. Um, the advantages to mediation, the two antagonists can speak freely to one another. They are encouraged to share freely. Um, mediation is confidential, um, so there's no case law. Um, there's no law because it's not, you're not in the legal system, you're kind of adjacent. Um, the outcome is not legally binding unless the parties agree it will be in the first place. Um, in California, typically like divorces that are handled through mediation, those, dis those mediations generally tend to be legally binding. So if you enter into mediation, know whether or not the decision is going to be legally binding or not. Or no, not the decision, the outcome is legally binding or not. Uh, mediation offers the strongest win-win potential because each side technically in a mediation is going to give up something that they want in order to like get the, the, the issue resolved. And you really don't need attorneys in the mediation process unless you want one. Arbitration is another form of um, alternative dispute resolution. And arbitration also has a, a neutral third party, but but the third party is an arbitrator, and that arbitrator has the power to impose a, an award, okay? Um, many consumer disputes, when you sign those terms of agreement, um, you are giving up your right to go to court if you have a dispute. You are signing on to alternative dispute resolution or arbitration. You're signing on to arbitration. Um, what happens in an arbitration the arbitrator listens to both sides and the arbitrator issues a binding decision. So they make a legally binding decision. Um, the issues with arbitration is that when you go into ar arbitration, you're giving up a lot of your rights. You're giving up the discovery process. There's no discovery process. You don't have the right if you're upset to, to, to start a class action lawsuit. Um, and arbitration is a confidential process, which means that it doesn't create any precedent and so there's no case law that stems from arbitration and there's no appeals rights. What also can happen in arbitration is I can have a dispute, I'm going to use Verizon Wireless. I can have a dispute with Verizon Wireless and someone else can have a dispute, same exact dispute with Verizon Wireless. 
both go to arbitration and you can have two completely different outcomes based on um, the arbitrator, uh, based on how you present your case, um, based on a variety of factors. So arbitration, in essence, can be less fair. It is quicker and it is less expensive. And so there are advantages to arbitration, but that's something that each party has to weigh for themselves. And I would say that frequently, um, most folks would, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, I guess it's gonna be up for you to, to yourself to decide whether or not arbitration is a good thing for you. I can see when it's a good thing and when it's not such a good thing. Um, what else did I wanna mention? Oh, all of those judge shows that you see on TV, um, people's court, judge this, judge that. Um, those are not real courtrooms. Those people may have been judges at one point, but they are no longer judges. They're actually arbitrators. So those decisions that happen in those court shows are legally binding because they are a legitimate arbitration, but they're not technically in court. Um, so that's the end of the lecture. Again, what did you learn? What are you going to take away um, from the lecture? What of this can you apply to your life? You learned something about um, jury summons. I know that for sure. Uh, so that's it.